for almost um, 2,000 years or better, there, uh, actually almost 2,500 years, there was no divinely sanctioned church building on the face of the earth. Every church building they had was either an altar or, as it was in the Garden of Eden, uh, just a podium between two trees, uh, or it was the tent of a father. There were patriarchal priests. But all of a sudden, God is going to have a nation. So immediately, one of the first things that he did after he called the nation out of Egypt, called his sons out of the world, gave them a law and ratified it with them, he designed a church building for them. Now let's read about that in Exodus 25. Verse 1 says, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. Every man giveth it, uh, giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering. Now, you understand that uh, God didn't uh, take a vote as to whether or not the people were going to give for this church building. Uh, in the dispensation of grace, it is different, of course. Uh, you get the consensus of a congregation to move forward with a building. But with a theocracy, with a nation that just covenanted with God to do all that he said, God said, fine, first thing you're going to do is give of your substance, and we're going to build us a church building. And uh, it says in verse number 8, And let them, with this substance, make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them, according to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. Now there were no church fights <laughs> about what the church was going to look like. The pattern of the wallpaper, the color of the paint, the color of the carpet, uh, there were no discussions given as to, well, what are we going to do with this? And what are we going to do with that? God said, you're going to take up a collection and I'm going to tell you exactly how to make my church building. Now, uh, it's not a very elaborate building. I mean, you would think, after all, if God were going to give first impressions about this church, it would be a magnificent cathedral. I mean, stained glass windows and a whole business with regard to it. Gold everywhere. Uh, everybody comfortable. And as you say, the air conditioning. There's a lot of air conditioning here. Uh, the air was conditioned with the temperature of the desert. <laughs> uh, hot in the day, cold during the night. It was nothing but a tent. That's all it was. That's what the tabernacle means. A tent with a fence around it. Now, there was gold, but there were no windows, period. The only light on the inside of the building, the tent on the inside of it, was from the golden lampstand. Now, that indeed was pure gold. And it was the only light they had to, to see thereby. Now, there's great topology here, but we're not going to deal with uh, this type uh, uh, today. Then you have the altar, um, or table rather, of showbread on the inside here. Uh, at this point you have the altar of incense. This is called the holy place. In the white here, divided by a curtain, you have the holy of holies. There was only one piece of furniture that ever inhabited this place, and that was the Ark of the Covenant. However, we're going to see that there's something else in just a little bit that actually came into the Holy of Holies and uh, performed a very special service. Again, the symbolism there is tremendous. Out here in the greater area of the tabernacle, the tabernacle proper, you have two pieces of furniture, the brazen altar and the brazen laver. And then here you have a gate and, uh, with a curtain, and here you have a door with a curtain. Now this basically is the floor plan of the tabernacle. And as you just read, God said, here's how I want you to make it. So the dimensions, the design, the pieces of furniture, how it was uh, constructed, how it was to have uh, been laid out before God, was all given of God. Now, if you would, please turn to Hebrews chapter 9. 
Now there's something else that is really special about this building. If you were a vampire, you would love it. Because it was a house of blood. Blood was everywhere. Uh, every time they had a church service, there was blood. And uh, it always tickles me when uh, we have uh, the um, little old ladies who, who come to church in these uh, big uppity refined churches to study the Bible, which, which again, as we heard, uh, rarely does that ever happen. Uh, but uh, but uh, they come and they study and uh, read a verse in the Old Testament. And, oh, yes. I would just love to have them attend one of these Old Testament tabernacle services and have to wait in line where hundreds of people had a sheep, a goat, or a bullock uh, coming up to the brazen altar, laying their hands upon it, and seeing the priest slip the throat and sling the blood on the brazen altar. I mean, if there wouldn't be some fainting and some, <laughs> some upset little old ladies, uh, uh, well, there would be. Uh, they wouldn't attend such a church. We had a church like that today. Uh, they wouldn't go because it's too bloody there. Uh, you preach that blood gospel where Christ had to die on the cross. Rather go to a church where there is a bloodless gospel, say, in the Mass. That's why uh, nothing bloody about the Mass uh, we sacrifice Christ in a non, uh, uh, or in a bloodless way, rather. So, anyway, everything about this building had blood. And in Hebrews chapter 9, it says in verse 21, When the building was dedicated, moreover Moses sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Everything about this had to be dedicated in blood. It couldn't be used unless the blood touched it. Uh, you couldn't partake unless the blood touched you. You had to be a lit a literally a blood-washed individual in order to partake of this. So the priests were all uh, daubed in blood. The participants in the covenant had to have the blood sprinkled upon them. Every single article of furniture had blood. Why? Because the Old Covenant was the law. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission. You see, if you break the law, that means death. That means your blood, uh, your uh, neck is in the ringer. Verse 23. It was therefore necessary because they had ratified the law. And before they built the tabernacle, guess what they did with the law? They broke it. He was on the top of the mountain receiving the tablets of law, written with the hand of God. He came down, and guess what? They were worshiping a calf of gold, and they broke the law. Very first commandment, have no other gods before me. Second commandment, no graven images, and so on. And so Moses had righteous indignation. He said, what good is this? Uh, uh, they said, well, everything that the Lord says we will do, God gave what he said. We come down and they broke it the very day I received it. Just crushed them right there. But God took those tablets and he put them in the Ark of the Covenant to indicate that the law was broken. The covenant was broken. And so from here on out, if you want to get into the presence of God, guess what you have to have? blood. So what we're going to do is we're going to follow a blood sprinkled pathway from the outside of the tabernacle all the way in from the outside where God abandons man, where man is an alien. He is a stranger. He is a foreigner to God to coming inside of the very holiest of all where God accepts man, blesses man, calls him his son, and, uh, and gives man his own righteousness, and where man and God can have fellowship. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do then is look at, briefly, an outline. And that is an outline of some of the substances that God used to... Uh, show us how to get from the outside in. I heard a song, uh, oh, it's been, I'm dating myself now, it's probably back in the 60s, where the song was, uh, a guy had, had just been uh, 
uh, given a, a Dear John letter, and he says, I'm on the outside looking in, and you can just picture in that song, uh, there is his uh, uh, dearest in there with someone else, and he's looking in the window, yearning and longing. Well, that's the way it is with man and God. Man is on the outside, and there's no windows in this building. But they say God is in there, and I'm not allowed in there. Boy, what a predicament. Uh, what a development this is. I'm on the outside looking in, only I can't see in there. I'd really like to know what's going on. Now, if I bust in there, if I go charging in there, I'm going to end up dead. So God says, okay, look, I'll allow you to come into my presence. I'll allow you to have fellowship with me to actually see what goes on. Be in the inner circle, in the inner sanctum, so to speak. I'll allow you to come into the Holy of Holies. But you've got to do it with requirements. And there are ten requirements. There are ten things that have to be sprinkled with blood before I'll let you in. Okay. Now, we're going to go through, and in your outline here, uh, by the way, um, in the uh, uh, point number five, where it says the brazen laver, pure brass, my uh, reference is wrong there. It's Leviticus 8.11. Uh, I'm sorry for that. Sometimes that happens in the course of events. It's Leviticus 8.11, and it has to do with the brazen labor. That's point number five. But what we're going to do is just briefly during this first hour tell you about the materials and the combinations of materials that will take us from the outside in. There are ten of these things, and you have uh, simply got to understand them if you want to get from the outside in. Now, uh, I had a question yesterday saying, well, what practical application is this for any grace believer? The practical application is this. This is what your salvation is all about. You are a participant in the new covenant, a new and living way, where you can go within the veil simply by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. His death on the cross of Calvary has satisfied the requirements of God on your behalf so that you don't have to offer uh, uh, something on the brazen altar and have a representative take that blood that you've offered into the Holy of Holies on your behalf. You have already believed in the blood that sanctifies forever and you can boldly come into the Holy of Holies. You can boldly come to the mercy seat, throne of grace, same difference and seek grace to help in time of need. So understanding the tabernacle has great implications for us in the dispensation of grace. This is what it's all about. You're on the outside in Adam. You're on the outside looking in. You have no fellowship or participation in the family of God or with God. But God will give you a relationship and fellowship with him. And that's what this study is all about. So the first thing then that we're going to talk about, and that's Point one, that we're not going to look up the scriptures now, we're just going to talk about the substances, is pure wood. This was the door and the lintel, the upper doorpost of your house. This had to do with the feast of Passover. And on pure wood, there was blood. Now, this symbolically speaks of the cross. Guess where the blood is or was that God accepts for your protection, for your rescue from death, the destroying angel. Where is that blood today? I'll tell you where it is. It's in his word as looking back to the cross. For even Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. Now, there were two places you could be in Egypt uh, as far as God was concerned, when he decided to call out his people, you could either be in a house with no blood or in a house with blood. Those in the house without blood are deemed to be in Adam. And the word of God says, as in Adam, all die. 
So if you're in a house with no blood on the door, the death angel is going to get you. Uh, it got the firstborn, but the firstborn are indicative of the children of Adam. Anybody who comes from Adam is the firstborn in Adam, qualified for condemnation and judgment, qualified for death. You didn't have the blood on the door, fine, you're going to die. But if you had the blood on the wood, Jesus Christ bore our sins in his own body on the tree. And the blood here on the door is indicative of the cross. And what they would do is simply take a, a branch of hyssop, dip it in the blood of the lamb and strike it as you strike a nail in a hand or uh, uh, for a nail in the feet for the Lord Jesus Christ. Strike it on the doorpost and on the lintel. Now, the wood also speaks of his humanity. This was just regular wood, as is said in the scripture. We've got acacia wood coming up. It's different. This wood simply speaks of him as being a regular man. He came, he lived, he died uh, on behalf of mankind. Okay, the next thing that um, we, uh, we have to see, oh, by the way, everything here emphasizes especially his humanity. Everything here emphasizes his deity and everything in between his special work as the God man. I actually have them broken up here so that we have 10 elements. Okay, element two. When Moses ratified the covenant, he took blood. The first was the blood of the lamb. The second was the blood of a bullock. Now, he took that blood and guess what he did? He sprinkled it on the book, the written word, the covenant. And he sprinkled it on the people. So, guess where we're going to place the blood? On people. Now, what is the significance of this for us today? If you're going to get into the presence of God, you not only have to come from a house where blood is on the door, you have to come from a, from a circumstance where blood is on you, where the blood of the covenant has been applied to you. The Apostle Paul says that we're saved today through faith in his what? Blood. And if we do not have the blood applied to us, there's no way we're going to get into the presence of God. But now, it's one thing to have blood on the flesh of the people with whom God covenants. It's another thing to have the blood on the sacrifice, the very person who is the, the testator of the covenant. And if you're going to make a covenant, then the testator has to die because that's when the covenant is brought into effect or made effective. Now, for the old, it was the blood of this oxen, but it symbolized the Lord Jesus Christ. He forever has blood on his flesh, as it were. Uh, he has offer up, offered up his own body, his own blood on the cross of Calvary. He has the marks of the cross on his person. And so, therefore, the blood is on him. What we're talking about is the Lord Jesus Christ here. He provides the blood for the blood-sprinkled way. It is his flesh on the tree for the Passover lamb. It is his flesh, literally, uh, for, the, for the oxen and the new covenant. And then there is a, a third thing here indicating his humanity. We're going to learn about something that's called the door. And we're going to learn about something that's called the way. All right. And just before you could enter into the tabernacle proper, guess what you had to do? You had to sprinkle blood again. Only this time, it wasn't the blood of a lamb. It wasn't the blood of a bullock. It was the blood of a red heifer. It's the only female that's offered here. Now, the heifer was totally red, couldn't be blotched or uh, in any way spotted. It had to be totally red. And it speaks of life 
in the womb or coming from the womb of, of, of this animal. She could not have spot, she could not have blemish, and no yoke, indicating she could never have had a burden of her own to carry. Now, it's indicative of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the one who is going to give birth to a new race of people, who is going to give birth to a flesh without the sin nature, a flesh that can be glorified, a flesh that is immortal and uh, incorruptible and so forth. Now, what they did then was sacrifice this uh, red heifer and take her blood and they sprinkled it toward the door of the tabernacle. Now, everything in the tabernacle faces east, all right? So you want to get some bearings here. So their back was to the east, and they were sprinkling it toward the door, which faced east. Now, this was known, therefore, as the way, the blood-sprinkled way. You can't get in there unless... The ground on which you walk is holy. How am I going to sanctify that ground? Through the blood. Through the blood of the red heifer. You can, like the Lord Jesus Christ, purify your flesh to go on the inside. And that's what the red heifer speaks about. The blood of the Passover lamb, protection from the destroyer of death. Uh, The flesh here, um, that of ratification of uh, the very person who makes the new covenant has the blood on him as well. This is the purifying of the flesh. Now, there's one more thing, uh, as we will see. This linen door was an extra special door. Wasn't as special as the veil, this, uh, uh, this curtain here. But it was a special thing, speaking of the humanity of Christ. It had four colors. It was fine twined, meaning that there was a a one thread basically uh, made out of two fine twined linen. His deity and his humanity. He was a special person. But the first curtain emphasizes his humanity. Here are the colors. White. His humanity was impeccable. He posed no threat to the righteousness of God. He himself in his flesh was righteous. Blue, his heavenly origin. He was sent from the Father and became a man. That's the Christmas story. Purple, his royalty. He's the King of kings, Lord of lords, head of the church, son of the Father. Inheritor of all things. And red, he is the substitute for sinners. The red speaks of his cleansing blood an entrance into the very tabernacle itself, ultimately to the presence of God. All right. So these three things then speak of his humanity on the tree, his blood on his humanity, his humanity being acceptable to the righteousness of the Father. All of that poses the first three steps into the tabernacle. And might I say, you cannot get into the presence of God without having first gone through these three steps on you. You have to have come from a house where the blood was applied. You have to personally have the blood applied to you. It must be on you, sprinkled on you. Now, in in the dispensation of grace, that comes simply by believing in his cross work, believing in his blood. Thirdly, Jesus Christ gives his righteousness to you so that as you enter, the very righteousness he had as a human being is imputed to you as a human being. As he was ultimately qualified now to enter in, you too, through his righteousness and work, are qualified to enter in the door.